Okay. David Kennedy, though, he's a past president of this academy. He's been here since almost the very beginning. Um, you guys have probably already heard of him because he's written books. Uh, probably my favorite book is How to Save Your Teeth. It, it's one that I still refer back to uh, with patients and friends because it's just a very good book. It was written in 1993, I think. Uh, he did a documentary called Fluoride Gate just a few years ago. It's awesome, too, which you can get access to that. He did Crippling Waters, another good documentary. You did uh, Poison Horses, I think, which I'll give away a couple of those. These are all about acute and chronic fluoride exposure and things that uh, a lot of people didn't even know about. So he was really ahead of the curve on all this. He also did Fluoridation, Let the Truth Be Told, Parts 1 and 2, along with Michael Connett of the Fluoride Action Network. Uh, he's the chair of our fluoride committee. Uh, been a member forever. He retired back in, I think, 2000. Practiced for 30 years, though, prior to that, so if that tells you his age. Um, great guy, a lot of information. Uh, I assume you're on this thing, so I can stop right there. Okay. So without further ado, Dr. David Kennedy. And by the way, I don't have any financial interest in a product in my talk or any of the companies offering grants and monies. Are they offering grants and monies? The, um, for this continuing education, medical education program. So, you know, it, all this does is cost me money. But, yeah. How did I speak in 27 countries around the world? I bought an airplane ticket and flew there. So, and very seldom do they ever get any uh, honoraria. But um, Griffin was saying, uh, you know, how did he come to understand? His, uh, his dental school made a real big mistake. He had um, all, all years of dentistry lined up together. You know, everybody was in the in the same room, seniors, juniors, sophomores, and freshmen, exactly the same thing happened to me uh, in, in the 60s. Um, Bob Barkley, who was a very popular, humorous speaker, came to uh, the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He flew his own little 172 down there from Macomb, Illinois, and they put together freshmen, juniors, seniors, and Bob talked about preventive dentistry. And, you know, the, uh, he was explaining to us that, you know, that the tooth decay is, is a nutritional and a dietary problem. And then if you um, disinfect the mouth and use a microscope, look and kill it, that the mouth gets well. And I was sitting between a junior on the left and a senior on the right. And the senior's reaction was, damn. Just get a degree, and they find out how to stop the damn disease. He was upset because his goal was to become a dentist and make a zillion dollars. The junior on the left was, how come we never heard this before? You know, and Bob was talking about, you know, scraping the scum off the teeth and the stuff that's considered normal today, you know, floss, brush, killed. But, you know. You can't kill those germs with a piece of string. I said, you got to put bait on the end of it and say, here, here you go. And so, but anyway, he was skeptical. He never heard it. We were freshmen. We didn't know anything. So we, we sent our um, senior class, uh, our freshman class president, Steve Haught, an uh, uh, Air Force lifer, um, down to talk to the uh, dean, H.B.G. Robinson, who wrote the book on pathology. And he blew up at Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, hot and called him uh when he was radical they called him a student <laughs> the air force lifer you student radical get out of here you'll find out next year so that's the way my school deals with new information and that's actually how dentistry deals with anything is new because they do not have the ability to change and that's actually a symptom of mercury intoxication is that your old memory your new memory doesn't so you can't make new synapses if you're exposed to mercury. How do I know the dentist are exposed? It's unlawful to sit in a room and mix, pack, carve, polish. And so I asked a guy, uh, Claude Baker, if you ever have a pair of Baker scissors, he, he put a little curve in the scissors like you could. So he was famous for his Baker scissors. I asked, uh, you know, hey, how's this uh, mercury, how, how's that safe? Because my mother had given my grandfather, a dentist, a whole lot of hard time because he would take a penny and, and put mercury in his fingers and rub it around and give the grandkids a, a shiny dime 
that was really a penny with mercury on it. And uh, she, mom was sort of assertive, and she told him to stop that. <laughs> so, so I had some knowledge that mercury was not really hunky-dory. Um, and we asked Dr. Baker uh, how, how this was uh, um, safe in the mouth. And he, says, and he had a big plate in his head because he wrecked his motorcycle. And, um, and so when you asked him a question, he would, uh, once it's covered with saliva, its toxic properties are rendered harmless. And then fall asleep. He had narcolepsy. Um, so when I got to, I was at the University of Kansas, I have a degree in biochemistry, and I was in there making a porphyrin ring. If you haven't made a porphyrin ring, it's really a lot of fun. So I was in there making a porphyrin ring, and a guy came in a space suit and reached in with his tongs and took the asbestos pad out from beneath my Erlenmeyer flask. And I said, hey, 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 you know, that flask will break from the Bunsen burner. And he said, uh, no asbestos allowed in student areas. It's a carcinogen. And so... I was somewhat shocked when I got a big jar from Casey Dental of Periopac, and I read on the ingredients, 50% zinc oxide eugenol, well, I'm familiar with that, and 50% asbestos. And so I asked Dr. Baker, I said, Dr. Baker, uh, you know, this is asbestos. And uh, he said, oh, this is covered with saliva, it's toxic properties are rendered harmless. And I got the idea that maybe there was a standard answer that he gave for everything that came up that had no bearing in reality. The, uh, so so it, it, bring your skepticism to the issues. Because if you are, I don't mean, dentist mistakes skepticism as being um, the equivalent of research. No. If you, you go out and do another experiment that's better designed and show a different result, that's what a skeptic does. The other ones go around and just badmouth people that are doing good research. And that's, uh, uh, I'm going to get into that today. So um, one of the reasons we're having this talk at all is because how does a, a little tiny group, uh, we started out uh, with 13 people and uh, we've changed dentistry. You, I go up to half the, half the people in the world and say, in the, in the United States, especially I'm in California, and uh, the, you ask them, you know, mercury fillings. Oh, they don't use those anymore, do they? I don't have any mercury fillings. I, I, our Uber driver, and she said, uh, what are you guys doing here? And we told her. And uh, she said, I had a mercury filling once. And uh, she said, when I was a child, my mother was on welfare. And I said, yeah, Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, Indian Service, Welfare, VA. Those are the organizations that use mercury willy-nilly, and they're also the ones that control uh, your access to information. Is that they don't fund research, you don't see it. So um, I'll show you how we uh, turned the tide on that one. Uh, let's see if I can advance this. Uh, if I push that, there we go. And um, I need to move over here a little bit. Um, in... 1984, uh, a bunch of dentists went to hear uh, uh, Hal Huggins. And uh, Hal is a, a fellow that made a lot of noise about uh, mercury. And um, they sat and listened. And uh, they didn't like, Murray Vimy didn't like the level of science. You know, that some of them actually do have degrees in science. And he didn't like the level of science that uh, Dr. Huggins presented. And uh, so um, he sent a letter out to everybody that had attended the meeting and said, you know, why don't you come to Banff, Canada, and um, we'll set up a, a scientific organization. And, and there are these fools that thought maybe mercury was bad. And um, some of those fools you will see here today. Um, I see Dave Reggiani. I don't know if Ron Dressler's coming. Um, but, you know, here, here we are 35, 40 years later, and they're still showing up to the meetings and, and doing what they can to move dentistry forward. And what this is, is why this academy has moved forward, is that there are a whole bunch of people here who have the courage to look at Claude Baker when he says it's, uh, and, and you left off my favorite quote from Heber Simmons, that uh, a, pedi a pedi pediatric dentist, he, he goes on to say, dental amalgam is absolutely safe. That's really interesting, because no scientist in the world will say absolutely at all, ever, and uh, 
but anyway, um, uh, this was an interesting collection of people. Um, a, t a physician, uh, Bill Dole, um, uh, an attorney, Alan Rand, um, uh, industrial hygienist, David Doors, and a bunch of dentists. And uh, they basically were able to put together uh, an organization that I, I really revere. And, and how did they do that? Is that they basically looked at what was available in the way in the scientific literature. And we got together and adopted a name that uh, the first the first name was uh, I, I wasn't there, so I can't be blamed for IOMT, but <laughs> I was in one of our members. Who had, one of the things you can be rest assured is that if you're mercury-free and your colleagues are not, they will attack you. And that uh, I was a, in a deposition defending one of our colleagues, and uh, the uh, lawyers were saying, well, how do you say that? I, I, and I said, oh, that's EMPT. <laughs> <laughs> and to the rest of the deposition, they'd call it eomped. <laughs> but I just smiled. Um, then we developed a statement of purpose. And so if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. So the statement of purpose is to disseminate and gather and promote and fund research. And that uh, looking at the uh, oral health, and uh, it's on our it's on our website. But uh, we are now this day uh, a global network. Uh, throughout the world, and that's because our members have taken time off in their practice to go to Brazil. I've been to Brazil three times, um, Germany uh, twice, Switzerland, um, and we've organized dentists there. And that, uh, that it's really powerful to have the science at your back, and that's, and that's what we do, is we gather the science, and if there's a hole in the data, if there's a missing... Um, quotient or something like that that we need to develop. We design with the help of our science advisory board. We have a science advisory board so we can actually determine these things because, you know, I didn't, don't show me statistics. The, um, but, you know, I know people that know statistics. And so we'll work through the statistics and look at it. And we design these things so that we can answer some questions. And um, I think that was smoking teeth, but it didn't want to play. Let's see. No, wait a minute. There it is. Um, smoking teeth is also my video, if anybody wants to know. Um, you know, it, it, I have been able to uh, reach out to more than the dental profession by making videos. After I retired at the turn of the century, I started making videos right and left. I got 25 of them. I, I traveled to, to China. I filmed China's battle with crippling water. The, the Chinese Department of Endemic Disease Control knows that fluoride destroys the economics of Inner Mongolia. And they went there and fixed the economics. Well, what was causing the economics? Well, the fluoride in the water crippled the farmers so they couldn't scrape up a little enough living. And they showed me a village where they'd fixed the water, and they showed me a village where they hadn't fixed the water. It wasn't a scientific study. They did the scientific studies. I just went there and... And while I was there, my uh, late wife Betty had a had a. They wouldn't let you in China if they knew that this little teeny box she had was a digital video camera. But that ended up I called it accidental video because she videoed all these people talking to us, and we showed that it, you know even four parts per million, which is legal in the United States. Um, the Trinity water used to be four parts per million. You could buy it at the store and poison yourself if you want to. Crippled people, and uh, we were talking to this one. One family, and, and the, the, the lady was uh, our PhD, uh, MD, that was our guide, uh, pointed out that even the chicken was crippled. <laughs> and so, you know, oh, yeah, it's too bad. Um, so in order to do good research, you need a good research facility. And Murray Vimy, uh, the founder of the uh, organization, lived in Calgary, Canada, and he went to Calgary Medical School. And he... Managed to uh, become a professor there. He also uh, teamed up with a very, very picky, hard to work with fella, but a wonderful scientist, uh, Fritz Lauscheider. And they began to design, conduct, and publish experiments. And uh, that way, we, uh, Wayne King was collecting uh, uh, breast milk from uh, his uh, uh, em employees and uh, uh, patients that were. Uh, nursing and counting the number of mercury fillings in their teeth. You guys 
I'm not quite as old as I am, but you know, the average person in the United States, when this argument started, had 12 mercury fillings, 12 surfaces on the occlusal surface. Members uh, contributed, volunteered time, money. Uh, I used to say this is the only organization I had to pay to speak at because the first decades or so, I'd pay to go. <laughs> have to pay to let them speak. And uh, we used to meet four times a year. And why? Because there was a whole lot of stuff happening. And every meeting, people, did you see this study? Did you see this study? I had a library that you see. East Coast, West Coast, Middle, and it just went all. Chief Member, am I silent? <laughs> I hear it come on every now and then. Yeah, I think I kind of like that doing some more. <laughs> all right, we'll try that. Let's see if it doesn't burn a hole in me. So. But anyway, that, that, was, that was the beginning. In 1990, we met in uh, Pleasanton, uh, and uh, that was the first meeting that uh, Jim, see him here today, we had dinner last night, an attorney who's been very helpful in defending our members. But uh, Jim, show, his, his uncle, uh, Jim Adams, was a member and uh, drug his uh, uh, nephew into the meeting. And he said, he was in a meeting, it was our, our annual meeting, and it had about this many people in it. How did those little teeny people change the world? And I'll show you. Um, at that organization meeting, Mike Ziff became the executive director. He got out of the practice of dentistry and started helping this academy grow. Um, his father and his wife also helped. The, and they would put together, back in the day of paper, they would put together a nice thick brochure of meeting the documents for the meeting. And the, anybody published a new paper, you got the paper in your brochure along with a, a, a big, long list of uh, uh, research that I uh, appreciated. Um, he wrote volumes of books, uh, Infertility and Birth Defects. He wrote in 1980, one of my favorite books. Uh, it's slam dunk proven that the females in dentistry are damaged by their exposure to mercury. Their fetus is damaged, I guess I should say. Um, so that was the issue of uh, the safety of dental amalgam. Um, and um, they also used to have sent out a newsletter called Biopope. And uh, the, uh, one of the things, in, in 1984, the American Dental Association had a meeting. It's called the Biocompetitive Metals in Dentistry. They want to include, you know, other things like nickel and uh, cadmium, cobalt. And uh, so they had a meeting, you know, this to discuss the science. And but the interesting thing is they passed the uh, the conclusions at the beginning of the meeting. Conclusion? I don't know. Um, so that so Mike thought that that was the meeting, the first meeting where they actually admitted that mercury was coming off fillings. And Mike said, well, you know, that's it. That's the end of it. You know, because you know, Dr. Simmons didn't mention that. Well, the first study to show that mercury was coming off the fillings in uh, a scientific manner was uh, 1926 by Alfred Stock in Germany. And the ADA put together a committee and said, oh, that Dr. Stock, he's just a stupid German. He doesn't know anything. Head of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. He was the top scientist in Germany, and he measured his own breath. And by blowing it into a leather bag, and he measured mercury in 1926. Which I mean, I wouldn't be able to measure mercury without my $5,000 Jerome sniffer. But no, Alfred figured out how to do it with new glassware and and a leather bag. And uh, so we they call it the, so. Pay attention. If 
Some organization is calling a scientist a bad name. Look at what the scientist discovered, because I guarantee you, the scientist is not the problem. The problem is their discovery is interfering with the income or the attitude of the organizations calling them a bad name. A um, wonderful book by uh, Jane Hightower. It's called uh, Mer Diagnosis, colon, so this would appear in a medical chart, Mercury. And she's a Stanford medical doctor, MD, and she was able to figure out that all of these uh, Silicon Valley executives and, and workers coming in that had strange and unusual things like ringing in their ears and headaches and, and peripheral neuropathy. And when she went through and did a differential diagnosis, and the, the diagnosis of mercury intoxication is impossible with a medical test. It has to be done by a knowledgeable physician that looks at the symptoms, eliminates other causes. So it's a diagnosis of elimination. And what she concluded was Mercury seemed to be causing these people to have all these odd, strange, unusual problems. And so she did a dietary survey, found that they were sushi eaters, went to Fisherman's Wharf, bought half a dozen different kinds of fish, sent them out for testing, and none of them should be eaten. They're all toxic. And contacted places like the FDA, and they say, oh, we don't measure. Oh, don't look, don't find. That's very nice. Yeah, we don't measure. So freshwater fish are contaminated as well. We have made a mess out of this planet. Um, some of the worst were in a, uh, um, a, um, a lake that was near a dental office. And the dental office was on a septic tank. And so the septic tank would leach out into the, into the lake. It, it takes a, an infinitesimal amount of mercury to make every fish in that lake inedible. And that's what they actually found. So... Um, Anyway, because the NIDR admitted that you were exposed to mercury from your fillings, he was absolutely certain that was the end of it. He figured, 85, it's done. Um, sadly, Dr. Ziff never saw the, the conclusion. It has been a, instead of an aggressive, oh, we need to stop doing this, it's been a pushback. Oh, you can't prove that cause this. You can't. So they're using proof of causation in order to make decisions, and I would encourage you not to. Is it my theory is that if you look in a, a Petri dish and you see a problem, then you need to look in an animal. And if you see the same problem, you need to move away from that substance, whatever it is. I I'd only need two studies, Petri dish, animal, I'll move another direction because I'm not vested in. And, and, but it, it helped that Bob Barkley talked to my dental school because what we learned in dental school about how to brush was the Stillman technique, where you brush down on the uppers and up on the lowers. And that what Bob talked about was the Bass technique, 1936. He's telling this in 67. You aim the brush at the gums and dig. And you have to use a, a brush that Dr. Bass invented and then gave to the profession, but there's no patent on it. So there's no reason for the profession to uh, embrace that. So they embrace oral bees. You can't do the Bass technique with an oral bee 60. It's got too many bristles. If I were the fat man in the surface line on a bed of nails, if there was one nail, I wouldn't like it. But you get a thousand nails, we can tap dance on that, can't we? So that's the trouble with brushes. So anyway, you have to get your brain ready to flip because you're going to hear this weekend stuff that you've never heard before. And if you have any questions, we'll back it up with real solid science. Because the answers are clear to anybody that wants to look at the science. Um, analytic procedures should be investigated for documenting exposures to metals. That's what the ADA said. Okay, good. Well, we still don't have a good way to diagnose mercury except by autopsy. And uh, I'll get to the autopsy results in a second. Um, so then they worried about nickel salts. They should be. Because the very first metal to ever be regulated in the United States was nickel. Because it caused cancer. And so there are studies showing that lab technicians making your low cost, don't, if you're going to invent a toxic casting material for crowns and so forth, don't name it after yourself. Rex Ingram called it Rexilium and uh, USC. And so technicians working, polishing Rexilium developed throat and lung cancer from the nickel. Well, that's 50-year-old news. 
the nickel was a carcinogen to the workers, and, and Congress actually passed a bill that said so and so can't use, can't make stainless steel. Did you know stainless steel is nickel steel? Well, these are the kind of things we learn. And um, nickel, beryllium, chromium in partials. You can show if you make a chrome cobalt partial, the patient's chromium level goes up, but so does their cobalt level. You know, metals are not benign. We are biological organisms. And so a lot of dentists, myself included, try to not use any metals. And that's nearly impossible because the forces on the teeth, you know, calcium hydroxy is a metal, calcium is a metal. So fortunately, what's happened in the last 40 years is the materials we have have become much, much better. And uh, so uh, assessment should be made of mercury loss from chewing. And so they, they're saying in 84 they should do that, but there was a study from the 70s where they took old fillings and measured the amount of mercury in it, and it was 50% less than what it was done the day it was put in, 25 years later. Well, where do we go? So they're recommending research on stuff that's already been done. Studies should be determined whether methylmercury can be formed in vivo. So here's when I talked in uh, Brazil, that the insisted public health department insisted that the dental materials professor come and speak about what he told the students. And he came and, and told us that he explains to the students that there are many kinds of mercury, and some are very toxic. Dimethyl mercury killed Karen Waterhan, uh, just two drops on a latex glove, killed her within six months with mercury in the brain. And so uh, dimethyl mercury, methyl mercury, the kind that's found in fish, uh, mercury chloride, the kind that caused uh, uh, acridinia, a, a, de a, a death, a terrible death for babies, infants uh, that were exposed to uh, teething powders. They used to put mercury chloride in a little powder, and, and if the baby was crying, you know, because he was cutting a new tooth, you just put a little bit on your finger and rub it on the gums. And then the baby's hands would turn red, and the feet would turn red, and they'd die. Five percent of the infants that died in England in 1939 died of a terrible disease called acridinia, or pink's disease, because the bottoms of the hands turned pink. And they banned mercury chloride teething powders for nipple rash, diaper rash, teething powders, and not one infant has died in England since. So why don't we herald this great, wonderful thing? We've stopped an epidemic of acridinia by taking mercury uh, out of teething powders. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, we don't want to mention that because that would impugn the pharmaceutical company. You're talking about pharmaceutical companies. What did they do? They didn't like losing the sales of their mercury chloride teething powder. So in 1956, they went to Australia and introduced teething powders. And Australia had a huge outbreak of acridinia the following year. And Fortunately, somebody from England had a telephone and called him up and said, hey, hey, Mike, don't you know what's going on? And so they banned it again in 58 in Australia. Some clever devil went back and looked at the grandchildren of the children that had acridinia back in 58 and found that they had four times more autism. If mercury causes autism, mercury causes acridinia. And it's a genetic subset of the population, or actually a constellation of genes that leads to that. So when you say, oh, my granddad lived to be 94, my dad lived to be 100, he used to mix the mercury in his hand with amalgam. He mulled it. He was taught in dental school to mull it. I got the squeeze cloth where you're supposed to put too much mercury in, you put in a squeeze cloth and you turn it around like a little ball and squeeze the mercury out and you thump it a couple of times and make the little droplets fall all over the floor and or in the carpet or whatever. And that's how you, I was taught to make amalgam fillings. And that uh, he only lived to be 100. So some people are very sensitive to mercury. There were people that could not go into a dental office because it had mercury contamination. And... Uh, so they know they're sensitive to that. Um, they also said epidemiological studies should be initiated to assess the prevalence of mercury allergy. So they're now trying to change the discussion to a, an allergic reaction, and it does happen. You get itchy. You have a red uh, patch. It's called lichen planus as well. Um, biological sampling procedures investigate to determine a reliable means of estimating body burden. We still don't have that. Studies initiate accurately assess blood levels. Okay. The thing about blood is it doesn't tell you doodly. 
Because what happens is if you inhale mercury vapor, it goes in your lungs, absorbs in your blood, it's in your blood for about three minutes. Long enough for elemental mercury vapor to transfer across every membrane in your body. Elemental mercury vapor is a ghost. It has no charge on it, and it goes everywhere. It goes into the kidney, the liver, the heart, the lungs. And so why would we measure the blood? Because it leaves the blood rapidly. And the claim is, oh, that means it's safe. No. Where do it go? Into the organs. And that's where it causes the problem. Research should be initiated to determine whether the effects of mercury on T lymphocytes is because of the work of David Eggleston. David Eggleston put mercury fillings in a uh, dental assistant, in perfect experimental subject, and watched the, uh, the six, six people, watched their T cells go down, took them out, watched them go back up, put them in, watched them go back down, took them out, went back. In his office, he has framed a, a letter that was written with two different typewriters. And the one says, when he wrote for a grant to do more work, his professor at USC wrote a grant to do more work, they said that there's no need for further research on dental amalgam, it's known to be safe. And then the next paragraph came down and it said, and furthermore, you haven't warned your experimental subjects of the dangers. <laughs> was that schizoid or what? Um, Studies should be initiated to develop more uh, definitive tests for determining the hypersensitivity to metals used in dentistry. Um, and, you know, how do you do that? It's very old. It's the same as the user allergies. It's the IgG test. And now we've got some really nice, sophisticated tests, uh, MELISA, where they take your white blood cells and put them in uh, different aliquots, and, and we see which ones uh, uh, affect those white blood cells and which ones don't. Um, so we've, we've done that. That wasn't done by the ADA. That was done by us. Now, who's got the money? That would be them. Um, determine whether a relationship between the mat maternal exposure, mercury, and, uh, and they're looking at birth defects. Ter teratogenesis is birth defects. Well, that means you know, you're missing an arm or a leg or something like that. No, that's not what it causes. So they want to go look in the wrong direction. Why don't we want to look and see if it lo lowers the IQ of the baby? Why don't we want to look and see if the baby has ticks and uh, inconsolable crying, et cetera, et cetera? No, let's look and see if it has an arm missing or something. Um, effects of uh, conditions that accelerate corrosion of dental materials. Actually, the new copper alloys leak more mercury than the old ones because corrosion slows the leakage of mercury. Um, but you no, know, now they're saying, oh, we don't need corrosion uh, because you end up swallowing those products. I'll show you in a minute. Um, continued research, alternative restorative materials. And we've got some fantastic. You know, if you had a kid come into your office today, you had a, a, a speck on the top of the, the lower first molar. Instead of drilling the middle third of that tooth out and sticking mercury in to expose that child forever after, you take your laser and <laughs> burn the hole a little bit and flow in your flowable composite heat it up and bond it, and that baby will be there when that child's 80. We have wonderful ways to fix teeth without mutilating with a giant burr. Um, so what, what did we do? This, this, is, this is what they said to do in 1984, and Murray Vimy and the team at Calgary, and the, with the help of uh, our academy, raising funds so that they, we could buy sheep and stuff like that. And this the first one was done on human beings, where they went around in Journal of Dental Research. These are, we pub he started out publishing dental journals and um, found that you know, this is not of interest to dentists. But on the other hand, he showed that if you chew gum, it, may, it goes up. And then they uh, um, did an estimate of the body burden. Um, and so, you know, if you find mercury, it's going to exceed the uh, minimum risk level because the minimum risk levels are minuscule. You can't even get close to a, an amalgam and not exceed the minimum risk level. And so, well, you know, like one of the dentists at the FDA hearing in uh, 2010, uh, after they heard all the, our risk assessment, we paid for a risk assessment there. And, and one of the dentists that was on the FDA panel, he, he said, well, how much over the minimum risk level can you go and still be safe? And uh, Richard Kennedy at the a Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry about swallowed his tongue. And he said, well, the minimum risk level is, a, is a, a red line in the sand. He said, you can't go over that. That's why that was developed, because there are vulnerable subsets that that will impact them. It might not impact everybody, but that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at impact on anybody.
and that's the minimum risk level. So the answer is, yeah. So by 1986, we'd shown that the mer mercury coming off the fillings exceeded the minimum risk level. They nailed it. Significant exposures, significant body burden, all three published in peer-reviewed journals. And what did they do about it? The committee in Calgary said, stop experimenting on humans. It's unethical. It's unethical to expose people to mercury. They weren't exposing people to mercury. They're just measuring the amount of mercury people were exposed to. Nevertheless, their ethics committee said, stop that. And so, good. They stopped further experimentation on humans. And then um, Richard Fisher is a plagiarist and a songwriter. And we're walking around uh, Phoenix uh, one time, and, and uh, I said to Richard, I said, um, you know, you've been quiet all evening. Uh, I said, what, what are you thinking about? And he said, all I, all I can think of is Murray had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. <laughs> and he, had, he had, had the whole song put together. We sang it once. Um, and so why did he think about lambs? It's because that's the next experiment that Murray did is that they went in, and this is a single animal, okay? But you can tell where the mercury came from because see how it all turned black in the, in the sheep? That's because it's radioactive mercury, and you don't get radioactive mercury unless you happen to own a nuclear reactor. And so they took dental amalgam, 10% of it, they irradiated the mercury, then Murray, who was the top dentist in his class, put in, under very strict conditions, uh, a dozen fillings in the sheep. They let them live for another 30 days and then sacrifice the animal. And this is the way that medicine looks for cancer. And so this is a, a scanner that's looking for a radiation that's being emitted out of that sheep's body. And you can see that there's mercury in the jawbone, the kidneys, the liver. And this little uh, spot over here on the left is the ileocecal valve. Um, the, this black thing here is, it, are the intestines. Those are particulate matter coming off the filling, going through the animal. Um, but the, the, how about the stuff in the jawbone? This animal has no teeth. Before they sacrifice, after they sacrificed the animal, before they made this scan, they took a saw and cut all the teeth off, put all those teeth in a radioactive protective container, and sent them off to the hazardous radioactive dump. There are no teeth in this animal's mouth at this particular point, no, no amalgam fillings, I should say, because the jaw is still there. Well, what's that black in the jaw? Oh, that's periodontal disease. And there's lots of studies showing that if you put a mercury filling in a tooth, that it loses a millimeter of bone if it's a two-surface filling in between the teeth within the next year. So we have a whole profession that's built around causing disease. Um, because the sheep's kidneys were very heavy in mercury, they decided to look and see if uh, how the uh, uh, kidney was functioning. And this is a measure of function. It's called an inulin clearance. In inulin is a protein that is not saved by the body. Robert Baratz, in a debate, said, well, this sheep had diabetes. It's got in insulin problems. No. Inulin is a protein. Insulin is also a protein that has to do with diabetes. And, and rats said, oh, well, that, that sheep's kidneys lit up like a Christmas tree. But there was more radiation outside the sheep than inside the sheep. And you see how there's little specks around here? Well, it's lying on a cobalt mat, which releases a very low level of mercury that will show you the outline of the sheep, but cannot get through the skin of the sheep, much less the cause of the darkness in the intestine. And Murray said, you know, it would be helpful if you read more than the uh, picture. So, um, shocked? I was, I'm going the wrong way. Um, so, Lorscheider's mercury uptake in sheep fetus. Now, the sheep is an interesting animal that you actually has a double placenta, and so you can actually externalize part of the fetus and measure the fetus while it's gestating. So they went in and tapped the fetus, and within three days, mercury was found in the maternal blood, amniotic fluid, fetal blood, maternal urine, and feces. So contrary to what Dr. Simmons said, the mercury's not locked into that filling at all. 
and it spreads to every organ in that sheep's body, including the fetus, and it actually concentrates in the fetus. The fetus is higher than the mother. Um, 16 days after placement, maternal mercury, maternal mercury levels were highest in the kidney, liver, GI tract, thyroid. What happens if you damage a thyroid? When I was in school, they taught me that uh, damaged thyroid was cretinism. Well, the politically correct person is you're not supposed to call somebody a cretin anymore. Okay, what would we call it if somebody can't tell what day it is and drools on themselves? So uh, that's what happens if you damage the thyroid in a baby. They end up, Ugh. so anyway, the mercury levels in the fetus were the highest in the pituitary. Well, pituitary, pituitary, what is that? That's the master controller of the entire hormone system of the body. And there's an autopsy of dentists that finds it really high in the posterior pituitary, which is the one that controls the pituitary. So anyway, it's, it's nice. But you can follow this molecule throughout the body. How did we get to do this? We worked at it. We raised money. We, got, we bought sheep. We bought animals. We bought um, 33 days post-placement, the birth time. Most fetal tissues had higher levels of mercury than mama. That's not a good thing. Because his mama accumulated her mercury over a lifetime, and here in a few days, the, the baby exceeds mama. Uh, nursing? How about mercury in the milk? Yeah, it goes right out in the milk. So and so do all the pesticides. The environmental working group, send some money to them. They're good. They measured 150 toxins in maternal breast milk. Still good to breastfeed the baby because the bottle-fed babies have lower IQ and they have injury from the bottle because that there's, there's no control over that. Didn't you just read the article the other day about what do you, what do you find in baby food, you arsenic, mercury, cadmium? So at least it's filtered through mama. Um, 73 days after placement, mercury levels in the mother's kidneys, liver, parotid glands, pancreas, pituitary glands, urine, bile, brain, and thyroid continued to rise. How high does it go? I don't know. We didn't, didn't continue it after that. We concluded that mercury vapor released from dental amalgam is readily absorbed from the lung, gastrointestinal tract, jawbone, progressive accumulates in maternal fetal tissues and, expo and with exposure duration. Neonatal mercury exposure from this dental material occurs via milk and also in, in the womb. Huh. Results indicate that dental amalgam can be a major source of chronic mercury exposure. How come I did that? The wrong button again. Um, so what did the ADA say about the sheep study? Oh, sheep chew too much. Okay, Dentists are easy to fool because they're damaged with mercury by the time they get out of their freshman year of school. The fact that sheep chew too much was actually written in the study because what they wanted was an exacerbated chewing model. Do you know how many hours a day a sheep chews? It said it in the paper. Didn't you read the paper? They chew for eight hours. How many hours a day does a teenager with gum chew? No, more like 12. So even though it's an exacerbated chewing model, here are monkeys fed bananas. And the same thing happened to the monkey. You can't really see it that well. And the sheep, I like it better. The monkey is splayed out like a filet. And you can see the, uh, the jawbone has black just like the sheep. The kidneys show up. The GI tract shows up. Um, and when you do tissue analysis, the same thing happened to the monkey, happened to the sheep. Have you ever heard the ADA say anything about the monkeys? The monkey study was underway at the same time the sheep study was published. But they didn't say a thing about it. And after the sheep study, Ann Summers, who it works with our academy, called up Dr. Lawscheider and said, say, Oh, well, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm running out of time here, so I got to get moving. Um, so what she did is she showed pathology of the gut flora. Well, why is that important? If your gut flora is messed up, you end up really goofy. Um, so interactions of human commensural bacteria, they form antibiotic-resistant bacteria. You hear how hard it is to get an antibiotic that works today? Well, more Antibiotic resistant bacteria are created by placing amalgam in people's teeth and all of the use in animals and humans ever. Um, all of them developed that. One of my good friends, Boyd Haley, came to the, uh, Chicago in 1989. His research, he teased out the problems with Alzheimer's. His research, all of his years, has been on brain. 
and that he invented a molecule when he was in graduate school. And he was able to use that molecule to find out the biochemical pathways in brain of a number of neurological diseases. But looking very specifically at Alzheimer's disease, he was able to show that every single aberrancy in Alzheimer's disease seemed to be caused by mercury. And he said and apologized that he was unable to uh, cause that same disease in animals. Uh, and Murray said, what kind of mercury did you use? He said, I use mercury chloride. And Murray said, mercury chloride has a charge on it, so it's not going to cross the blood-brain barrier readily. And Boyd said, I don't have an animal hospital where I can do uh, elemental mercury vapor. And Murray said, how many animals do you want? And well, I keep pushing the wrong button. And so um, the, uh, what, what they determined was that the uh, mercury, elemental mercury vapor, Boyd had one of his graduate students, Kurt Pendergast, and you can find it, 1997. They exposed animals to elemental mercury vapor, and they caused Alzheimer's disease in animals by making them inhale mercury. All of them. Not just, but they used a high level. That's a criticism. So what? We live to be 70. The animal lives to be a year. So you got to use a level that's at least 70 times higher, right? So... So anyway, this is getting kind of technical. Kirk Pendergast is a study. I can send it to you. Um, Amy Holmes is a doctor in uh, New Zealand, and, and she called up Boyd, and she said, I don't think mercury has anything at all to do with autism. And it's because Boyd was very famous for saying he thought thimerosal was linked to autism because autism is the non-lethal form of acridinia. And we already know mercury causes acridinia. Everybody admits that, even Wikipedia. So what's autism? Autism is the level where you didn't die. And Amy said, well, I couldn't find any uh, mercury in my autistic children. And Boyd said, exactly. Is it, it, they're non-excretors. They can't get rid of it. And so they did this study, the baby's first haircut. They took the baby's haircut and measured the number of amalgam fillings in the mother and showed that if the mother's got mercury fillings in her teeth, the more mercury fillings, the more mercury in the, in the baby's hair, if it's normal. And if it's abnormal, developing autism, then there's no mercury in his hair at all. It's a non-excreter. So I think that's an elegant. I won't show you this. You can watch it on the internet. Um, this is how mercury causes neurodegeneration. Basically, it's showing that a little teeny bit of mercury causes the nerves to slough off. Um, Jim Love uh, represented uh, Tolhurst and uh, um, Stanford medical doctor said that he was injured by amalgam. Sued for damage. The ADA says they owe no duty of care to the public. So can we rely upon them to protect the public if they're arguing they owe no duty of care? They say they don't regulate dentistry. Ha! Their certificate of seal of approval is only for packaging and purity. Controls the dental board. If you call the dental board overview committee... It rings in Chicago at the ADA office. They used to answer by the ADA secretary, but now they've changed it. They use their dental board positions to attack dentists that say there might be a problem in our profession. And I would tell you, if you ever get attacked, and be careful about what you say. I'm very concerned about the amount of mercury coming off fillings and the exposure to dental personnel and their patients who are still using amalgam like welfare, Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. That's a legitimate station statement. If you connect the dots, mercury is causing autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, MS. Then they will attack you because you connected the dots. Don't connect the dots. Um, they're saying you act below the standard of care. The IAMT has a standard of care also. The ADA does not develop the standard of care. The standard of care is what your peers do. And in this academy... We're your peers. Um, Wayne King took his uh, own mercury amalgam amalgamator and a mercury sniffer to the FDA, and they took it away from him so he wouldn't expose the members of the FDA uh, hearing to mercury. Um, Rich Fisher has been instrumental in getting Congress to look at this. Um, and the, what happened this last fall uh, in, in September is... The FDA issued a warning and said, if you have kidney issues 
are pregnant or can get pregnant, have neurological diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, MS, that you probably shouldn't have mercury fillings. But don't get them out because that would be dangerous. They didn't explain how it was safe to put them in and dangerous to take them out. We will show you at this meeting how it's safe to take them out, but it's not easy. It's not grinded out. I can tell you that for sure. Because, so I quit poking the wrong button. Um, I got to mention Trevor Lyon. He spoke uh, at one of our earlier meetings and he explained the role of amoebas in periodontal disease. But that's because we're not the International Academy of Mercury Toxicity. My late wife used to call it the International Academy of Mercury Toxicity. We look at everything in dentistry. Any issue we can find, we tease it apart with science. And that is what Trevor did. He showed how the amoeba, a parasite, rapidly accelerates periodontal disease. Not the cause. Even back, C.C. Bass, you know the Bass technique? C.C. Bass in 1917 identified the amoeba, but it said it wasn't causal because he saw periodontal disease before the amoeba arrived. Well, what's the amoeba doing there? When you have periodontal disease, the amoeba comes in and eats the white blood cells. Um, Jürgen Slot spoke to us and, and talked about the role of herpes in periodontal disease. Bill Landers talked about how primitive dentistry is, and we use a sharp stick to see if there's periodontal disease. No, you should not use a sharp stick to see if there's periodontal disease because you just stuck those bacteria and stuck them deeper in the gum. Stop that. David Kennedy on half of the periodic review, our consensus approach to the control of periodontal disease. I did. 1997, the Perio Committee unanimously adopted the microscopic approach to monitoring periodontal disease because you can see these guys. You can't culture them. You can't culture an amoeba. You can do DNA testing, but it's going to cost you 250 bucks and take you know three months to get the answer. But you can see it in a minute. Cost you 10 cents. Um, so I'm I'm uh, fluoride's bad too. Um, I mean, you need more than that. The, uh, the, uh, um, we got 12 experts together in San Diego to talk about and do a risk assessment for the IOMT. I funded this through a nonprofit that I founded in 1980. And I had UCSD was giving a, a continuing medical education credit. And the organization I uh, had, uh, all, have also uh, gave dental education CE credit. And the day before the meeting, I got a notice from the uh, UCSD that they'd withdrawn. I got a notice from the uh, dental board that I couldn't give CE credit because the health of effects of ingested fluoride are not within the purview of dentists, dental hygienists, dental assistants. That is a medical issue, and you can only poison people. There you go.